Good afternoon and welcome to today's lunch hour lecture, which is the last one of the term. Um, in fact, the last one of the year. Um, today, um, we have um, Margot Finn, Professor Margot Finn, who will be lecturing on uh, rethinking the English country house, the Indians at home. Um, Margot joined UC in 19, sorry, 2012, and she's chair of um, modern British history. Uh, she's principal investigator on the project East India Company at Home, 1757 to 1857. She served as vice president of the Royal Historical Society, and she recently curated an exhibition at Osterley House um, on the trappings of trade, a domestic history of the East India Company. Um, she will leave a few minutes for questions at the end. So please, will you welcome Margot Finn. Well, thank you very much for coming today. Can I just do a sound check? Can everyone hear me? You can, very good, excellent. You can as well, perfect. Uh, if that stops at any stage, uh, just wave frantically and I will, um, I don't know what I'll do, but uh, something will happen. Uh, it's a real pleasure to see you um, here today and to be able to talk to you about a topic um, which I think um, all of you will bring uh, knowledge to um, because the English country house is um, so totemic, um, so iconic in many ways in our understanding of English material culture. Um, and what I'm hoping, it, it is my, my deep desire, that I send you away looking at the country house rather differently. I won't necessarily convince you to look at it in the way that I look at it, but I hope that you will see some things in the country house that perhaps you've not seen before. So that's really my ultimate um, agenda. Um, and so I'll be focusing on elite domestic interiors, stately homes, particularly country houses, and particularly in the Georgian and Victorian period. So the long 18th and 19th centuries are really the time period that I'm concerned with, though in interpreting them, I'll be straying very much into the 20th century, um, as you'll see in a few minutes' time. So uh, we're now going to see if the clicker actually works. Indeed, it does. Um, I'm going to have four parts uh, to the talk. The first two will be quite brief. I'm going to begin by giving you three key questions that I'll be thinking about as I give you this lecture. Um, I'm then going to talk very briefly about historical methodology. How is it that historians rethink what they think about the past? And that will be um, very brief. The great substance um, of the talk will then be looking at the manufacture of the English country house as a national icon, as an icon of Englishness, and the ways in which if we situate that icon instead in an imperial or a transnational or a global context, we come to think about it rather differently. So that's the main substance. And then at the end, I'll draw some perhaps wild conclusions and welcome your questions and answers. All right, so that's where we're going uh, today. What questions am I addressing um, here? I think there are really three. Um, I want you to think about why we think about the English country house as quintessentially English. Um, and I suppose I should give warning at this stage. I am going to use England rather than Britain and British in this lecture. There is an analogous story that one can tell about the Scottish and to an extent, the Welsh country house as well. Um, you are welcome to pelt me with questions about the differences and the similarities at the end. And I have a wee bit of Scottish material at the end if I get to it. Um, but in general, I'm going to use Englishness as similar to, though not equivalent to, Britishness in this lecture. So um, why do we think about the uh, English country house as being quintessentially English is my first question. Um, how English actually is? the English country house. That is a topic that I want to investigate through a couple of case studies. And then finally, what happens if we instead situate this national icon into transnational, global, or imperial context? So those are my three underpinning research questions. Now, to get at those questions, I need, I think, to discuss a little bit how historians think. Um, many of you know how historians think because you're historians yourself or because you read a lot of history. 
But many people um, today come to history uh, predominantly through uh, films and television. And I have a bit of a bugbear about um, television history, um, which I think um, either radically misrepresents historical method or simply doesn't represent it at all. Um, and not representing historical method, how historical researchers ask questions, how they interrogate their sources, leaves one occasionally with the sense that history is just a succession of facts, one damn thing after another, as it's sometimes referred to, and that historical inquiry is merely going from having, say, seven facts on a particular topic to having ten. So that in that model, which I think is implicit and sometimes explicit in much popular history, to do history is merely to find out some new things in some new documents or some new material objects that one didn't know before. It's essentially a cumulative. And that, of course, is an important part of history. But it's only one part. A large portion of what historians do to come at new understanding, to improve how we imagine and present the past is really about reinterpreting existing data, re-existing things that are already in front of us, but that we're not looking at fully or not looking at from the right perspective. And in many ways, today's lecture focuses on the last of those two possible methodologies, not finding new things, but looking anew at the things that we already have in the English country house, for example, to reinterpret it. Now, those popular television um, methodless um, uh, visions of history, I think, come to one particularly on television when one sees the television historian, the media don, being given um, an object or a document, wearing gloves, and it's sort of handed to him or her, and he or she then has an additional document, an additional piece of evidence. And then having seen that additional piece of evidence, he or she strides purposefully through a landscape. And that seems to be really historical method as we see it in television. Um, and in that model, um, persons who perpetuate that model often say, well, if you don't have new facts and you're changing the existing interpretation of facts, that's ideological. And I want to get us away from that. Reinterpreting existing facts as an historian isn't ideological. It's what we do. That is historical method. And coming anew at the same objects is how we transform what we understand historically. Now, I'm not going to name any names about media persons who exemplify uh, the <laughs> model I've just drawn. Uh, I might indicate that it does tend to be predominant in certain prestigious universities, um, in Cambridgeshire and Oxfordshire, persons particularly who have read English at those institutions rather than history very often perpetuate this myth. And it's a myth that I want to move us away from in terms of how we do history. And I hope if you can open yourself up to uh, reinterpreting history in the way I'm suggesting, you will reinterpret the way you think about the English country house. All right, just for the tape, though I'm sure this will be cut out, uh, we're asking for the lights to be dimmed, and it will, I'm sure, enhance the experience of seeing the images. Um, so what I want to do today is to encourage you to walk through stately homes, to walk through country houses, and hopefully see some of the same things that you've already seen, because they've been there for decades, but to see them in a new way. Um, and in a way, the kind of methodology that I'm describing to you here fits very well with that old platitude. It comes, uh, among other sources, from a, a letter by Newton in 1676 about being able to see further because one stands on the shoulders of giants. And I, as a very short person, I and my guise as a dwarf, am going to be standing on the venerable shoulders in this particular talk um, of Sir Roy Strong. Um, and that's really where I want to go next. Uh, Newton, again, pointing out that we can see differently the same things if we come at them from a different perspective. And that really is how historians rethink the historians who have made arguments before. Just don't darken it so much, I can't see my notes, that's perfect. Um, 
And that is the way in which I am going about this particular talk, standing on the shoulders of a particularly eminent historian of the country house, who 40 years ago, almost to the day, um, established a paradigm, established a model of how we understand the English country house as quintessentially English, which in many ways continues to inform the heritage sector, continues to inform popular media, and is increasingly at odds with how academic historians understand the English country house. So that's essentially where I'm going to be going by standing on Sir Roy Strong's shoulders. So in 1974-75 at the Victoria and Albert exhibition, Sir Roy Strong, curator, art historian, broadcaster extraordinaire, mounted an exhibition on the destruction of the English country house. Uh, uh, phenomenally successful exhibition, very influential. And the argument in many ways of the exhibition was that the nation needed to preserve its country houses, uh, in particular from the tax regime, in order to preserve its own national heritage. And that is an argument that goes through all of um, Strong's arguments. We take them, country houses, for granted. Like our parish churches, the country houses seem always to have been there since time immemorial. Part of the fabric of our heritage, the ravished eyes stir the heart to emotion, for in a sense, the historic houses of this country belong to everybody, or at least to everybody who cares about this country and its traditions. And I want to focus on two things in that quote. One is the time immemorial part of the fabric. The interpretation offered in many ways by the destruction of the English country house paradigm is one in which the country house becomes ahistorical. It becomes separate from time. It's always been there. It's been changeless. It's meant the same thing over time. And for an historian, that's a very problematic argument to make. Secondly, if one doesn't believe in that country house and its historic, iconic national identity, then one is somehow placing oneself outside the nation. And that really was a very dominant uh, view in this particular um, exhibition, as you can see by looking at a few very short quotes that I've excerpted from the exhibition catalog. So, it has repeatedly been stated that the country house is England's unique contribution to the visual arts. That's one of the propositions I'll be exploring in this lecture. English country houses, whether palaces or manors, epitomize English history. So the country house comes to stand in for the much wider landscape of English history. Again, I want to interrogate that. And it is purely, is it purely fortuitous that the decline of our civilization and the collapse of the country house way of life are coincidental? That's perhaps one of the big questions I will leave you pondering. I won't refer to it with great uh, specificity. But I think these three quotes give you a good pithy understanding of the paradigm that um, was very um, influential coming out of this exhibition and has continued to shape the heritage industry and how we broadly think about the country house for 40 years now. So it's a, it's a big, long-standing um, paradigm. The country house truly epitomizes, in other words, just to sum up, all the aspects of the British achievements um, in the decorative arts, which find its national archive in the v &A. And we have here the exhibition itself being an ob ob objective manifestation um, of this national icon. So I think that gives you, as I say, a good epitome of what this paradigm is. And I think that that view of the Englishness of the English country house is very familiar to us from um, Downton Abbey, from Gosford Park, from those sorts of very popular um, depictions of the English country house and its domestic life and its material life. And it's really that that I want to play with. Because what I want to argue to you is that that vision of the English country house as an icon of the nation is one that's very much constructed in the 20th century. It's not really the predominant view in the 18th and 19th century when English people are living in or working in their English country houses. And I would argue really that it's the 20th century's regime of taxation 
and the emergence in response to that regime of taxation of organizations such as the National Trust that have been very influential in building this vision of the English country house as iconic of English national identity. Um, and we see this in the um, uh, very appropriate for budget week uh, notes on death and taxation end of the 19th century, notwithstanding there having been recently a agricultural depression, um, country house owners are facing a death duty of only 8%. And at 8%, the tax regime is not particularly hostile to the accumulation of large estates um, which maintain country houses, particularly in a legal regime in which primogeniture the ability to entail an estate onto your eldest male child allows that estate to pass in an orderly manner from generation to generation. So the tax regime at the end of the 19th century was not particularly hostile to the country house. That changes very dramatically um, by 1930. As you can see there, death duty is 50% in 1930. And this creates an extraordinary crisis in country house ownership as maintaining the country house generation after generation becomes increasingly difficult. And already by the 1920s, um, uh, this is something that is stirring real concern among the property classes, but more broadly among the literate classes. The Anglo-Irish uh, poet uh, Yeats in the 1820s um, states that to destroy a country house which has bred up a great man should be a capital offense. Uh, and you get a sense from this quote that there's an increasing level of hysteria about the demise of this country house tradition. And it's in many ways in response to that widening, hysteria is perhaps a little over the top, widening concern about the potential demise of the country house, that it becomes positioned as an English icon, as emblematic of the wider fabric of English history. Crucial to that development is the development of the English National Trust. Um, and it's the National Trust in many ways, when it's established in 1895, is not particularly bothered about the English country house. The first properties that the trust um, takes under ownership and takes under management are not country houses. This is not its particular vision of what is an historic property that needs to be protected for the nation. But by the 1930s, and particularly by the period after the Second World War, the combination of very savvy political organization by the landed classes and the tax regime has brought the National Trust very much behind the defense of the English country house as an icon of Englishness. So as I say, I would argue that this is very much a 20th century development, not one that has been uh, uh, with us for time immemorial, nor has the English country house been with us since time immemorial in the form that it takes. So I've just given you a very rapid, and I realize very schematic um, history there of the um, National Trust and its influence. What we're going to be addressing for the remainder of the essay is this, uh, of the, the remainder of the presentation is this question of how English are those English houses which come in the 20th century to be iconic of Englishness. Um, to do that, um, as was mentioned um, in the introduction, um, a group of colleagues um, of whom I was one spent three years with Leverhulme funding doing a project called the East India Company at Home, which looked at the ways in which the monopoly, the East India Company, that controlled British trade with all of Asia um, until the early 19th century, the ways in which the wealth the trade, the power, the politics, the sociability associated with that monopoly impacted upon the country house, perhaps raising questions about its Englishness. Um, the, at the end of the slides, which I believe will be made publicly available, I have the URL to the website, but just very briefly what the project did was to work together with the National Trust, together with the museum sector, together with local and family historians, to write open access case studies of country houses in their relation to the East India Company and to the Indian Empire, to explore that question of how English was the English country house. And this is simply um, one of our case studies, this one on cane furniture on the website. 
So, in order to address the question of how English is the English country house, I'm going to get you to think about two specific English country houses, uh, Osterley Park, which is behind me on the slide, and Swallowfield um, House, which is in um, Berkshire. Osterley, as you may know, is um, on the Piccadilly line, a very easy um, trip from where we are here, um, and is um, a particular kind of now uh, suburban, but once uh, rural um, retreat with a particular engagement with the Indian Empire that I want to unpack for you. So, this is Osterley. And in many ways, I think Osterley's entrance um, shrieks uh, tradition at you. It shrieks uh, a particular 18th century um, Englishness um, at you. It has a neoclassical spin that we associate with the Georgian country house to a substantial extent. The house itself is Elizabethan in origin. Um, in the 18th century, it becomes um, uh, uh, neoclassical in aspect, and crucially, it is refurnished in the later uh, 18th century by the um, Scottish Enlightenment architect Robert Adam. Um, and the house, which is now under the um, ownership of the National Trust, is traditionally presented to us as visitors as a neoclassical Robert Adam house. So it, it is very Georgian in terms of how we think of the Georgian country house. And all of those things that I've just said about it, that it's neoclassical, that it's connected to Robert Adam, it's very deeply connected to Adam. We've got a very good archival record of Adam's um, refurbishing of the house. Um, all of those things are very true. Um, but that, I would argue, is only half of Osterley's history. And I want to get you to think about that other half. These are the furnishings that one sees when, we walks it, when one walks into this neoclassical enlightenment English country house. Very often, until recently, one not only walked past them, but one walked past them without looking. Large numbers of Chinese lacquer chairs um, typically with the East India Company's insignia on them. Extraordinarily um, high quality Indian textiles and Chinese silks as well, dating from the early 18th century. Extraordinary uh, ivory Chinese junks, and they're very, very large, and an armorial porcelain ser uh, service from Jindajin in China that dates from the early 18th century. Some of you may know quite a lot about armorial porcelain. This is a very distinctive pattern and color, very unusual, and dates from around 1713. These objects, um, Osterley positively pullulates with them. These are only a few of the Chinese and Indian objects, all sourced through the East India Company and all crucial to the adornment of this neoclassical um, country house. And I think we have to ask some questions about how did those things get there? Why are they there? Are they simply there because people at the time liked these things, purchased them on an open market in London, and then moved them into their house? Well, in fact, um, we know that that's not the case because we've got good provenance in this case and because a number of the items date from so early on, we know that they could not be sourced on the open market in London. They come through a different connection. This is Robert Adams' wonderful Etruscan room. And again, it is called the Etruscan room. It clearly has an Etruscan motif on the walls. And yet, it is also chock-a-block full of Chinese lacquerware. The particular piece in front of you is a wonderful example of the Englishness and Indianness and Chineseness of the country house because it's been um, created by Chippendale how English can you get, from Chinese lacquerware um, and then put into an Etruscan room. And it's that hybridization, that mixing of strands to make an English aesthetic, which isn't English, that I want us to think about. Now, we know that these particular um, items in Osterley come to Osterley not simply through the market. They come to Osterley because the, ha the family that owns Osterley in the later 18th and early 19th century uh, are major East India Company investors, they are major East India Company directors, 
and they are major, um, have within the family major East India Company merchants, supercargoes, and other people. It is through the political, economic, and social connection to the East India Company that these objects flow into the home. The wealth, the objects, the aesthetics, the appreciation, the contacts that get you the armorial uh, 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 porcelain service that I mentioned, those aren't available on the open market. They're open through who you know and who you invest in, what you invest in. So Osterley is English, quintessentially English, but it is also quintessentially an Indian house. And when you walk through it, those Indian things are absolutely essential, sourced from the East India Company, whether they're Chinese or Indian um, in this period, Chinese wallpaper, all of the rest of it. It comes to the house with the wealth, with the history, with the personnel, with the sociability that constitutes Austerley um, as it is in this time period. And we've written up a case study on the website, again, all available by open access, that tries to retell the history of Austerley um, as a history that encompasses both Robert Adam, the British Enlightenment, the English Financial Revolution, all of which are absolutely essential to the history of this house, but that also tries to weave into them the history of the East India Company in India, in China, and crucially, in England as well. Um, and as I say, there's a reference at the end of the slides that will give you that if you wish. So why does it matter that we either see or perhaps ignore country houses as East India artifacts rather than English icons alone? I'm going to move to my second um, house, Swallowfield in Berkshire, to ask that question. And I have behind me advertising bump, uh, you can see it um, on the web yourself um, if you wish to, for Swallowfield today, which has, of course, been sectioned up into flats and is now a luxury um, uh, series of luxury uh, units. Swallowfield Park is a 17th century grade two listed classical mansion offering grand estate living in majestic style. Dating back to 1678, it was designed by William Talman, better known for English Baroque at Chatsworth, and a student of Wren, situated within 25 acres of traditionally maintained parkland, tradition, again, being important, which is available for the apartment owner to enjoy. It is individual and elegant country apartments of historic significance. So this is the history that is in the public domain and that is used to sell this house as an English country house. How does that history change if we think about India or if we think about the wider empire? Well, it's really interesting, the parts of Swallowfield House's history that are entirely removed um, from that history. In the 18th and 19th century, Swallowfield passes into the hands of Di Thomas Diamond Pitt. Uh, Pitt is a freebooting uh, English merchant who trades in India, makes an extraordinary fortune, founds, of course, the um, Pitt dynasty, a very important political dynasty at the time. Um, and the wealth then from India allows him to purchase several country homes of which Swallowfield is one. It becomes an Indian English country house in the 18th century. It's sold by the Pitt family later on in the 18th century and bought by a family of um, Caribbean slaveholders. So it moves from being an Indian house to being a Caribbean house funded through plantation slavery. As uh, the British government begins to contemplate abolishing chattel slavery in the Caribbean, profits go down in the Caribbean, the house is sold by that family, and purchased by the Russell family, who have just made their fortune in the East India Company. So it moves back into being an Indian house, none of which is captured here in the history that is retailed to prospective purchases of flats. It's a wee bit fuzzy, but that is Swallowfield, an English-Indian Caribbean country house, I would argue. Now, why does it matter that we either think or don't think about Swallowfield, like Osterley, from this transnational, global, or imperial context, rather than from a purely English one? Well, the first thing is economic. We can't begin to understand how the fabric of the house was maintained, how the house was refurbished, how the house was purchased and sold. If we think of England, if we try and tell the history of this English house from the perspective of an island nation, 
because it simply passes in and out of um, imperial wealth circuits from the late 18th century, um, really until it's sold in the 20th century. So very, very important from an economic perspective to understand that imperial nexus. Secondly, we have to understand the contents of the house, what's there, um, by thinking about the empire. Roy Strong and his wonderful magisterial paradigm about the Englishness of the English country house argued that the contents, the interiors of the English country house are perhaps the most important um, contribution to visual culture that has happened in Britain. Well, at Swallowfield, it's very, very clear that visual culture is only purchasable, that European art, those Gainsboroughs, they're only purchasable through East India Company fortunes. That's where the money comes from. And they sit on the wall at Swallowfield next to images of Indian and mixed race women and children. They sit next to the social networks that have garnered the wealth from the Indian empire. So that what's in the house, how it came to be in the house, is very much a consequence of empire rather than a con uh, consequence of Englishness itself. Crucially too, if we know about the imperial components of the house, we know which members of the family were allowed inside its doors and which members of the family were not. Um, Henry Russell, the second uh, baronet, brings back from India with him two legitimate children with his wife and on a separate ship and sent to an, uh, a separate location, a mixed race daughter who he calls Mary Wilson, so he doesn't give her, of course, his surname. And Mary Wilson is never allowed inside Swallowfield. So India funds the house. India, including many images of mixed race children, hang on the walls, but the sociability of the house draws a line around the Indian wealth, the Indian connections upon which it has been built. And I don't think we can tell a proper history of this English country house unless we bring into bear those three factors as well. So where is the English country house going and how much longer do I have? Um, I think I have time to go through this. Um, in the wonderful magisterial v and um, exhibition in 74-75 on the destruction of the English country house, tax was very much picked out as the um, instrument that was likely to sound the death knell of the country house. And tax is, of course, a potential um, concern, though the tax concessions um, that have been available have managed really in the 20th and early 21st century to perpetuate the English country house. So I'm going to deal with that less because I think it's in some ways the less interesting of the three. Primogeniture um, is currently under attack. So primogeniture, as you will recall, is the, um, the right of a country house owner to entail his estate, uh, to leave his estate collectively to his eldest son um, simply by virtue of the fact that that child is the eldest son. Well, you may recall with the um, discussions about the um, Duke of Cambridge and Duchess of Cambridge's uh, forthcoming first child, um, legislation was put into place to disrupt those kinds of non-gender equal um, inheritance patterns for the crown, and debates are currently going on about disrupting those kinds of uh, non-gender um, um, equal uh, inheritance practices for um, country houses as well, for landed estates as well. This may well sound the death knell uh, for the country house, and it puts it in a rather different perspective. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. I think the third factor we have to think about in thinking about the future of the English country house, including its Englishness, is I think in a way we need to have what I've suggested here as a SWOT analysis. Uh, some of you will have done a SWOT analysis. Uh, if you help to run an organization, you have to uh, periodically address its strengths, its weaknesses, its opportunities, and its threats. And I think in a way, we need to construct a SWOT analysis for historical interpretation of the country house. What are the strengths and weaknesses? What are the opportunities and threats to interpreting the country house? What are we missing out in our current understanding of the country house, how can we possibly claim to protect the heritage of the country house if we only understand small portions of it? 
And I would argue that we debilitate efforts to protect and think about country house material culture if we only tell one narrow band of its history, if we overly anglicize the history of the English country house we draw attention away from aspects of it, the global, the transnational, the imperial, that may be of interest to much wider audiences. Now, let me take you back before I uh, conclude just briefly. Tax, I think we have to think about tax. Uh, should we have a tax regime that protects historic country homes? If so, which histories are we protecting with those regimes? Second set of questions involve primogeniture. I'm going to leave that one behind uh, me because I think it is extraordinarily fun. This is the Highland clan's response to the um, potential effort to um, remove primogeniture uh, and the dire consequences that might happen, they argue, for the clan, for the country house, and for the home. Um, and I'm going to, I think, leave you there so that you have time for questions, if that's all right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we do have time for um, one or possibly two questions. Do we have any? Yes, here. Um, there's a mic's just coming towards you. Um, in the title, you mention um, English landscape. It, uh, la the landscape gardens, don't you? Um, I thought you were going to argue that. Um, that's the thing which is quintessentially English, not the houses which are more Italian, where they come from the continent. It's il giardino inglese, which is so English, all around the continent, from Russia, all through English gardens, or the Englishness yeah, yeah. of English architecture. Excellent. So just in case um, anyone didn't hear the question, it was about how, why are we calling these houses English anyway, when architecturally they're clearly Italianate, for example? And I think that's an excellent question. It's, it's almost a Nigel Farage moment, I think, when, when one gets to that question. Um, the, the idea that the Georgian look, which combines um, Italy and um, the classical world, how that becomes English when it is clearly European, is one of the unaddressed, unasked questions, um, I think, as well. But it certainly becomes in the literatures, I think the references I gave you to the Strong book, the exhibition catalog, it becomes stated that these European styles are inherently English. And I absolutely agree. There's another paper I could have given um, in, on, on exactly that topic. Yeah. Um, do we have another question? Yes, over here. <coughs> um, what is the contribution of literature to making um, us see these buildings as English country houses, say Jane Austen and, uh, you know, etc.? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Some of you may know um, the uh, very influential, important book by um, Edward Said, uh, Culture and Imperialism, in which Said asks us to reread, for example, Mansfield Park and to see Mansfield Park as a novel that, though often behind the scenes, is foundationally built upon Caribbean slavery, for example. Um, we haven't, in this particular project, um, made much of literary sources. Um, I don't think, and I maybe, I, indeed, I would enjoy being proved wrong in five years' time um, about what I'm about to state. Um, I haven't found the material legacy in 19th century English novels vis-a-vis -vis India to be as strong as that with the Caribbean. But one can certainly think of um, titles, and particularly by Thackeray, who of course comes from a family with a deep investment in the East India Company. There are elements of that. Uh, Wilkie Collins' Moonstone, again, figures around material objects looted in India and brought back to England. So I'm sure that there is an excellent dissertation to be written on precisely that topic. But in the meantime, I know you'd all like to, to thank Margot. Thank you very much. <laughs>